Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to CBI Now's live virtual event, all about CBI and assistive technology. If you're with us on our CBI Now parent group, drop a hello in the comments and feel free to post questions as they come to you. Captions are available if you'd like, but they're a bit delayed by about 10 to 15 seconds since they are live. I am Rachel Bennett, the content and community manager for CVI Now, and I'm a CVI mom. Today, we are talking about assistive technology. What is assist assistive technology? It's both low tech and high tech. What makes up an assistive, assistive technology evaluation and how to use these results to implement assistive technology matched to a child's unique needs in order to remove barriers to access. I am beyond excited to introduce our expert today, Ali Fetty, who is a TVI, an O&M specialist, and an assistive technology instructional specialist for people with visual impairments. So she's all the things. She is currently the statewide assistive technology consultant for the state of Vermont. Ali has presented both regionally and nationally on issues related to assistive technology for students with visual impairments, including CVI. Additionally, Ali has specialized training in travel needs of deafblind individuals. She currently serves as the chair of AER's National Accessibility Committee. I had the privilege of learning from Allie in uh, the CVI certification graduate program at UMass Boston. She knows CVI. She's a thoughtful and brilliant thinker. After the presentation, Allie is here to answer your questions, ones that were already submitted and ones that come up live. So here we go. I'm gonna stop my share and we're gonna turn it over to Allie. Hi everybody. I'm so grateful that you're having me today. Um, this is such an honor to speak to all of you. This is a subject that I'm really passionate about. And I think that unfortunately there's not enough information out there and not enough conversation around. And so I hope in my own little private special way, I'm um, sort of trying to bring a little bit more voice to this topic. A um, Couple things I just want to mention before I start, I'm gonna do a PowerPoint presentation um, to begin with, and I'm gonna try and keep it really concise. I was working on my uh, presentation the last couple of days and I was trying so hard to like delete slides out of it. And I just was like, I'm just gonna leave it all in there. I just want everybody to get the information. Um, so I'm going to move kind of fast, but um, I hope you'll forgive me and I can definitely answer questions about anything that didn't make total sense um, as I was presenting. That's number one. Um, number two is that um, I am an assistive technology instructional specialist. My expertise is in the area of assistive technology for people with visual impairments. Um, I'm not an expert in AAC. That's not um, something that falls within um, the scope of practice of what we call a CADIS, a Certified Assistive Technology Instructional Specialist. However, I've worked on a lot of teams with AAC devices. I've collaborated with a lot of speech language pathologists, um, sort of as the vision expert making that decision. So I will try my very best to answer questions on that topic, but I just want to be um, very upfront about the fact that that's not necessarily my area of expertise. Um, and then third, I'll just mention that I'm visually impaired myself. So um, I have low vision, I'm legally blind. And um, I like to just let people know that ahead of time because um, you may notice that as I start my presentation, you just get a really good view of my forehead during a lot of um, my talking and uh, you know, that's just the reality of being a visually impaired presenter. So sometimes I turn my video off, but I won't uh, today because I'll just let y'all see my forehead. Then I can just back up when somebody's got a question and I'm sort of addressing you directly. So um, with that being said, I'm going to dive into this um, PowerPoint that I have because I'm going to try and um, get through it as quick as possible and hope there's a lot of good information in there. So here we go. I'm sharing my screen. All right. Go ahead and present. Oops. All right, so can you see me okay? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so this presentation, as Rachel um, so eloquently stated, is about assistive technology and um, CVI, cortical slash cerebral visual impairment. Um, I am a TBI comms caddis. Uh, so I do, I wear a lot of hats and I do a lot of different things, but in all those things that I do, I really love working with kids with CVI and um, I have worked with many on my caseload and I have many on my caseload currently. 
Um, so I just want to start by just kind of getting us on a baseline of what is assistive technology, right? When I say assistive technology, what does that actually even really mean? Because a lot of times people jump to like the most expensive, the most high tech um, thing they can possibly think of. But AT is actually a lot more things than just that. So this is directly the definition from IDEA, which is the special education law that um, governs all special education in the United States. It's why students have IEPs that all fun falls under IDEA. Um, so assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment or product system, whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of children with disabilities. So that's a mouthful. So what my definition of assistive technology is any tool, anything that you can possibly think of that reduces or eliminates a barrier for a student. All right, that's it. That's all assistive technology is, is any tool that reduces or eliminates a barrier for a student. Um, so I like to show this little slide a lot in my presentations and it says, um, which one of these is AT? And on the left hand side, there's a picture of, um, you know, sort of a typical high end AC communication device. Um, and on the right side, there's just a picture of like a little cheap plastic straw you might get at McDonald's or something. Um, and usually when I ask crowds, which one of these is assistive technology, there's inevitably somebody in the um, crowd who always points the AC device and says, well, that's assistive technology. But really both these things are assistive technology, right? Um, so assistive technology is anything that reduces or eliminates a barrier for a person. So the straw for somebody who has, um, a, let's say, a upper extremity weakness or limited mobility in their hands who can't pick up a glass is um, just as powerful of a piece of assistive technology as an AAC device might be for somebody um, with, uh, you know, a complex communication disorder. So the, the straw, even though it's cheap and you can kind of get it anywhere, um, it's still a piece of assistive technology. Um, so what does the law actually say about assistive technology? So the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, so that's that special education law that we talked about, provides the primary guidance for assistive technology in the schools. The definition of AT is left specifically broad to allow discretion to the IEP team, right? They didn't want to be too prescriptive. They wanted to leave it pretty broad so the IT, IEP team could interpret um, assistive technology as they felt comfortable. The only devices and tools that are specifically excluded under the law are surgically implanted ones, um, such as like a cochlear implant. So that's the only thing that the law specifically says this doesn't um, qualify as something that a school is legally obligated to purchase. Um, oops, sorry, just clicked out of something by accident. Uh, oops. Okay, so the individual, um, the individualized education plan or the IEP uh, teams are required to consider assistive technology for every student on an IEP. So let me, I kind of stumbled through that. So let me just say that really clearly. Every IEP team is required by law to consider assistive technology for students who are on an IEP, all right? So if you have a child who's an IEP, IDEA says that child has to be considered for assistive technology. Now the team can determine that the child doesn't need any assistive technology, that's okay, um, but they have to go through that consideration process. Um, this includes tools needed within special education and related services. So think O&M, if, if a child needs something to participate in orientation mobility, let's say, um, as well as in the general education classroom and extracurricular activities. Um, so it's pretty broad. It's not just about what the student needs to access the gen ed curriculum. It's really across their whole day. On a case by case basis, schools must consider the needs of a student to have assistive technology in their home or other setting if it's necessary for that child to have a free and appropriate public education. So um, that kind of thing that sometimes I hear it's sometimes some schools, hopefully none of the schools that your students go to um, say it was like, oh, we just want to have the kid do homework because we don't want them to take that home the expensive device. That's not the answer. That's not OK. If a child, if the only barrier to a child doing homework at home is that they don't have a device to do it on, then they, they have the school has to consider a device to go home or a device, an equal device to be at the house. All right, um, 
I peak teams can get caught up in the sort of device when I talk the device talk. So that's like which device, the tool, the kind of tool talk, um, you know, getting real focused on the what's the item that we're going to end up with at the end of this conversation. However, IDEA, IDEA clarifies that assistive technology services are central to the IEP assistive technology discussion. Equally important to the kind of tool talk is the IEP services talk. Um, so what is an IEP service, right? So, um, or sorry, an AT service. So an AT service is the evaluation of the needs of the child in their customary environment, all right? And I put customary environment there in full caps because that's even more important for our students with CVI in some ways. Um, acquiring the AT solution, selecting, designing, fitting, customizing, adapting, applying, retaining, repairing, or replacing the AT device, and then also training and technical service to the child, the child's family, that's very important, that's right there in the law, that that is considered a protected AT service that IEP teams have to build in, and, um, and to the greater educational team. All right, so the most important thing to know about assistive technology is that it all starts with assessment. You can't do anything with assistive technology until you have a good assessment. Often when I do these presentations, the first question I get is, what's the best piece of technology for a kid with CVI? And the answer is it depends because every if you've met a kid with CVI, you've met exactly one kid with CVI. And so you have to start with a child-centered assessment to understand what where the barriers exist, first of all, and what tools are gonna be the best to eliminate those barriers. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what assessment looks like for, um, I don't know why I keep doing that, I apologize. Um, so every, with ch um, every child with CVI is so unique that a carefully planned assessment of the 18 needs of the child is critical. You can never say, I had a student with CVI um, before and fill in the blank worked for them because that, that is, that's, there is no cure-all for um, you know, a piece of technology that's gonna work for every kid with CVI. Um, while children with CVI are unique learners, um, principles that apply to assessments for all learners with visual impairments hold true, right? So in the field, we already know a lot about how to appropriately assess um, a child with visual impairment for um, their assistive technology needs. Those also apply, those same principles also apply to children with cortical visual impairment. However, the things that we're looking at are slightly different. So assessment must take place in the customary environment before the beginning the AT assessment, understand the flow of the child's day, right? So we've got to really understand you know, what is the schedule? Where is the student? When they're doing this particular activity? What's the environment before we can make decision about the tool? Um, while the process may be the same, the barriers are different. For example, instead of thinking, does the child need large print? You may think, how can I leverage technology to reduce complexity? Okay, so that's a little diff, that's sort of an example of a little bit of a difference between what you might think about for a child with ocular visual impairment versus I'm a child with a cortical or cerebral visual impairment. Um, you know, you're not necessarily thinking, you know, does the student need large print because things are blurry? You might be thinking, what kind of technology can I use to reduce complexity? Sometimes that does include increasing the print size. And so, but we're doing it for a slightly different reason, if that makes sense. The team should include individuals highly knowledgeable about the child's individual characteristics. The TVI is an essential part of the team well-trained TVIs should have the content knowledge needed to guide the team. And if they don't, um, that's, you know, that's why there are people who are um, stronger in the area of CVI, and there's also people who are stronger in the area of system technology. So um, TVIs can help bring those people into the team. If the child has additional disabilities, be sure to include all the service providers in the conversation. So the speech language pathologist, the occupational therapist, physical therapist, my behavior analyst, you know, any kind of additional service that the child um, receives should be considered as a part of that essential AT assessment team. Remember that parents are critical members of the team, okay? So while they may not take place in the direct assessment part, they have critical information about the child. And I feel that so strongly because parent involvement is the single greatest indicator 
of success with technology for children with visual impairments. Let me say it again, parent involvement is the single greatest indicator of success with technology for children with visual impairments. We know that from research. Now that research was on um, children with ocular visual impairments, but uh, I think, I can't imagine a reason why the same doesn't tr hold true um, for a child with a brain-based visual impairment. Um, that, that, you know, there was really good research out there that showed us that a child's success with assistive technology, the greatest single indicator was their parent understanding that assistive technology. And then when I want to go to, okay, there we go. All right. So um, the other important thing that's, I just feel like it's so important to talk about is the end of the role of the end user. And this is something that we really unfortunately forget about sometimes, especially with our kiddos who have complex needs. Um, so the end user is the student. They're the most important member of the team. Oops, I don't know why I keep, I'm so sorry that my PowerPoint is jumping around a little bit. The end user is the most important member of the team and often the most forgotten. So AT assessment must begin and end with the student. They should be involved throughout the process from day one to the greatest extent possible. It's gonna vary from child to child, but there is, I have never met a child and I've worked with pretty complex um, little kiddos, you know, pretty young kiddos with pretty complex needs who, who could have a significant role in their own AT assessment. So I have yet to meet a child that, that doesn't have a really important role to play in their AT assessment. Um, personal preference matters, right? We should really care about the personal preference of students. Um, from a young age, children with CVI need to be empowered through self-determination. The dignity of risk is a human right. So the, the only way that you develop self-esteem self-awareness, self-image is being allowed to take risks, to make choices that, you know, maybe are not exactly the same as the people who take care of you. And every child, every human being has a right to the dignity of risk. And including a child from the beginning to end an AT assessment is a part of that. Um, if you are a person without a visual impairment, um, you should try especially um, you should be especially sensitive to the preferences of the end user um, and make sure to maintain a community of practice, which includes adults with BI and CVI more specifically. Um, so that's true for teachers, and I think it's also true for parents. All right, so the, the tool I want to talk about the most today is um, called the SET framework. So the SET framework is a tool that I use a lot um, with doing AT assessments um, for children with cortical visual impairment. Um, and I'm gonna show you the set in a minute here um, so that you kind of know where to find it, but it's a really powerful tool um, for use with kids with CVI. So with the set, you're gonna define the problem and consider assistive technology. You're gonna gather relevant data. You're gonna generate possible, sorry, potential solutions. Um, you're gonna conduct AT trials. And you're also going to integrate successful tools and strategies. So what, what is the SET that I'm talking about? So SET is an acronym. It stands for Student, Environment, Task, and Tool, S-E-T-T, -T, the SET framework. Um, and what do each of those things mean? So um, with the SET framework, you're going to sort of methodically move through and you're going to consider the student, the environment, the tasks that they're doing in that environment. And then after you've done those three things, then you can talk about tools. So often when people go into an AT assessment, they have a tool in mind and they wanna see if the tool works. That's actually the total backwards, not best practice way of doing it. You start with a student and then the environment, and then you look at the tasks in that environment. And only after that, you get together as a group and say, okay, we need, to do, we need a device that does something like this. And then you go out and do the research to find the device that does that thing or the adaptation or the modification that does that thing. Um, so we start with the student because again, they're the most important part of this whole thing. So what are the individual characteristics of this person? Um, what are their strengths? What are their needed um, areas of support? Um, you're gonna consider gross and fine motor speech, social and emotional needs, multiple intelligences, vision and hearing. Um, what do they love? What motivates them? 
uh, what experience they have with technology um, and if they've demonstrated problem solving skills. And sort of the CVI specific things, some of the CVI specific things that we're going to kind of look at when specifically when we're doing an AT assessment is um, what's their strongest visual field? How does discrete um, or sorry, how does distance viewing affect the student? Uh, what does complexity do to the student's ability to attend? Um, does contrast or color make a difference? Can the child integrate motor planning with vision? How well does the child handle new materials? How does light impact the student? Um, how does movement impact the student? If there's visual latency present, and if so, um, what reduces that latency? So, um, once we've considered the, so we've got a really good sense of the student, right? We've spent a lot of time, we've reviewed the relevant medical data, we've looked at the functional vision evaluation, we've looked at the learning media assessment, psychological testing, you know, fine and gross motor testing, neurological testing. I mean, we've like done a deep dive in who that student is as a person. We're going to look at the environment. Um, and really, you can do this kind of interchangeably. So you don't have to look at a student in an environment. You can look at environment and then student and tasks, and, and you'll kind of switch back and forth between those things. But the only golden rule is you're not allowed to talk about tools until after you do those three things. And and I and if you walk away from nothing but the, from this presentation than this, you're gonna smack yourself on the back of the hand and say, "I Ali told you to smack myself on the back of my hand if if we started talking about tools without talking about these three things first. Um, so I like the idea of there just being a bunch of people out there at schools, just you know, giving themselves a little pat on the back of the hand and <laughs> thinking about me in an AT assessment. Um, so before I start the AT evaluation process, um, I like the team to have a fair, oops, excuse me, um, a fairly good idea of, of what the child's uh, schedule will be. Um, so what times of the day are they engaged in activities with same age peers? Um, what times of the day is the child receiving instruction in a separate um, space? Um, what other times of the day is the child out of the classroom, feeding, changing, et cetera? So, and I totally get it. You know, you've got this anxiety of being a school year. We've got to do the AT assessment. It's really important to wait to do the AT assessment until you have a really good sense of what's happening in that child's environment. Um, and where they are in different times of the day because, and I'll give a great example, I've made the mistake, that's how I learned this lesson. So I had a school that was like, hey, we, you know, the students got to do X, Y, and Z in the library. Um, can you come up, you know, with a, with a way for us to do that using technology? And so I go and I do this assessment and I see the kid in the library and we set up this beautiful thing and he's able to use it gorgeously. Um, and then I go back like a month later, once we've done all this setup to observe him use doing the setup. And I realized the time we were doing the assessment in the library was not the time that they were doing the activity. And so we went from totally quiet, beautiful, you know, low um, complexity situation to all of a sudden there's like 30, you know, third graders in the library with this kid throwing books and yelling. And all of a sudden, it, the kid, you know, he couldn't use it. It was totally null and void, all this work we put in. I learned my lesson the hard way, so I want other people to not make that same mistake that I did. Um, what are the environments the child's learning um, in and what are the conditions the child is operating within at the time the child is there? So that kind of goes back to what I was just saying about, you know, it's fine if you look at them in the library, but you need to see them in the library at the time they'll actually be doing that task in the library. Um, AT doesn't solve all the environmental issues, so that's the most important thing. Um, first, what can we do to set up the environment for success? Do we need the disco ball and rock music during snack time? And I'm joking a little bit here, but I'm also not joking because this actually happened to me where the school called me and said, you know, during, sna during snack time, the student just like can't participate. We don't know what's going on. They're like having a meltdown. You know, we need some help. And so I go in and they, literally there's, there's like loud music and a disco ball going on <laughs> during snack time. And I had to say, okay, it took me 30 seconds to realize this is what's going on. That's why this kid can't participate. So, you know, it's kind of like tongue in cheek, but it actually happens. Um, Environment also includes the people. 
what people does the child um, interact with on a daily basis? Um, who is responsible for the child's programming? Um, what is their uh, what is their competency in this area and what kind of training might they require in assistive technology? And also think about the school infrastructure, right? So I, for example, I'm here in Vermont, we have some really rural school districts where we are. Um, so I actually do have to think about like, okay, we're gonna get this Wi-Fi only device. Does the school have really wi reliable Wi-Fi all the time? Sometimes the answer is no. Well, does it make sense to get a Wi-Fi only device then for that student? The days the Wi-Fi is out because they don't actually have broadband in this part of the state where we are, you know, and some there's not an ice storm or something like that, like what the child just doesn't get to communicate or doesn't get to participate that day. So thinking through what the actual school infrastructure is. And then we're going to look at the tasks. Um, so uh, do, you're going to do a task analysis of the child's day. What are the activities the child needs to participate in? Um, what's the child's current workflow? What are the current tools, adaptations, modifications? Are they working? Is there a reasonable level of independence? Um, what barriers exist and where do they exist? And where are tasks similar and where are they distinct across the day? Uh, you must look at both the Common Core and the expanded Common Core curriculum. So I'm sure um, you guys have probably had some presentations about the expanded core curriculum, but if you haven't Googled that term, that's um, the area, those are sort of the special competency areas um, that children with visual impairments required additional instruction in due to their disability. Um, what tasks take significantly longer um, than cited peers? Um, do not forget to consider tasks the child is technically completing, but with a lot of adult support. So this is not independence, right? Um, they will do it when they get older is not a good excuse. Um, students will not have the prerequisite skills they need to complete the task later. Um, so if you, you know, other kids are getting all this incidental learning and background, and if we just keep saying, oh, they'll do it when they're older, it's going to be very difficult for a kid to actually catch up and, and do it when they're older. So we've got to set up students to the greatest extent possible um, to be doing things as independently as humanly possible. Um, we cannot wait for a child's visual functioning to improve to um, integrate them into their into their day, right? So that's why we really need to understand their um, sensory channels and, and different access points for them in different environments, because while we're always going to work on improving the visual functioning of a child with CVI, always, um, we can't, you know, sort of hold off and just say, oh, well, you know, we're um, not going to include them in other parts of the day. And that's what we're assistive technology um, can really come in, you know, in, in environments where the student doesn't have access to their vision, what other kinds of technology can we leverage to give the child access? Um, so, okay, we talked about the tools, oops. We talked about the tools, or sorry, the tasks and the environment. I'm, I'm really apologize, this is jumping around so much today. Um, We've talked about the student, the environment task. So now, and only now, can we talk about the tools? Not before, not one second before. So learning media assessment and CVI assessment are critical at this point. Um, understand your student's sensory learning channels, right? Are they auditory, are they visual? Um, are they more tactile learners? And what environments are they, those things? And how they relate to different environments across their day. Um, other appropriate tool types are uh, sorry, once appropriate tool types are identified, a minimum of two examples should be prepared um, for trialing. Okay, so that's, let me just explain what that means a little bit. So, you know, you make the decision that a particular, like a tablet, right? Um, let's say a tablet is something that's going to work well for the student because of the, you know, the, the barriers that we've identified. You ideally, best practices, you want to try at least two different kinds of tablets. Now that doesn't always happen, but that is what best practice is. Um, when trialing technology, do it with tasks that are below the child's ability level whenever possible, right? We wanna make sure that we're testing their ability to access technology and not, um, you know, that sort of if they understand the activity or not. And then um, not having access to technology in district is not an excuse. So definitely don't let schools make that excuse. Um, you know, just because they've got X, Y, or Z in the closet, if you, you at this point in the assessment process, you should have a lot of data to back up why that, why you need a particular thing. 
Um, and then, so when we talk about the tools, we wanna to ask ourselves what tools can assist with the barriers that we've identified? Are, cu are current tools sufficient with training or modification? Sometimes we have the tools, the child or the team just needs more training. And is there a continuum of tools in place, right? We always want a continuum of tools. We want low tech, mid tech and high tech. And, and low tech is like no batteries, you know, a straw, that's low tech, right? Mid tech is maybe something that's got some batteries in it, but isn't too much more advanced than that. And then high tech are those really high end devices, usually have a user interface, things like that. And the reason you need a continuum is because sometimes those high tech devices die, right? They run out of battery, they have to go back to the manufacturer to get fixed, whatever. So we have to have a continuum of technology in place. Um, and I know I'm running out of time for my presentation part, so I'm going to try and speed through the rest of this. Um, so you're going to consider both um, current and future needs. That's really important. So we want to create a roadmap for our students. Uh, we need to consider where they are now, but also where we want to project them into adulthood. Um, we want to keep students on pace with their peers. So like an example of that might be like we may not pick a Fisher Price toy for a sixth grader um, as a piece of assistive technology that they're going to use in class, like for letter identification. It, why not? Because maybe we can address that, you know, maybe we're just working on letter sounds and there's a lot of cool Fisher Price toys out there that do that. Um, but we want to always be thinking about age appropriateness and we want to always be thinking about, you know, can a student grow with this? So there's a lot of other great ways of working on letter sounds if that's what a child is working on sixth grade that are flat, that are devices that may be more flexible, can grow with the student or more age appropriate, all those things. Um, and then a few final thoughts about the set. Um, so the set is not prescriptive. Uh, the set does not require, um, does not dictate a process, but it does require a process. So um, as a team, you can kind of come up with the process that works best for you. You do need to have some kind of process for how you're gonna do this, but it doesn't dictate a process to you. Um, use the forms that work best for you and move through them um, in a way that works best for you. However, the tool talk always comes last. All right, I've said that a bunch of times. I'm saying it again, the tool talk always comes last. Set, the set is never complete. You set and then you reset, right? Because students' needs are always changing. So it's always a living document. Um, and remember, there's no magic wand tool that will solve all the problems. Students with CDI need a tool, a toolkit of tools and strategies like any other child with a visual impairment. Um, there is no right process for conducting an assistive technology assessment. The process I have laid out is a suggestion. Um, every team needs to come up with their, what works for that individual team. Um, and when you're in doubt, um, you can always look at the quality indicators for assistive technology. So I'm just gonna show that really quickly. Here. Um, so um, the QIAT.org um, has these great um, quality indicators for assistive technology. So if you ever want to know, hey, are we doing this AT thing right? You can always come here um, and click on indicators and matrices. Um, and it's going to give you these quality indicators, but there's also these great um, matrices um, that you can kind of like you know, together as a team, get together and score yourself. So I'm going to open the um, the, mat the uh, matrix for assessment of AT needs. Um, a PDF copy here. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so for example, the first quality indicator is um, procedures for all aspects of AT assessment are clearly defined and consistently applied. So an unacceptable version of that would be no procedures are defined, right? And then a four is going to be procedures are clearly defined and generally used in both special and general education. Um, AT assessments are um, conducted by a team with the collective knowledge and the skills needed to determine possible AT solutions that address the needs and abilities of the student, um, demands of the customary environments, educational goals, and related activities. A one, so that would be unacceptable, would be a designated individual with no prior knowledge of the student's needs or technology conducts the assessments. All right, that's like, that's bad. And a four would be a team whose members have direct knowledge of the student's needs, environments, tasks, and knowledge of AT generally conducts 
the assessments. And so, you know, you can kind of get together with your school team and, and go through one of these matrices and ask yourself, you have all these different areas um, that you can look at the quality indicators for. If you ever have a question, just sit down as a team and do one of these matrices. You know, you've got uh, matrices, the consideration of 18 needs, assessment of 18 needs, 18 IEP, 18 implementation, evaluation of the effectiveness of the AT, 18 transition, the administrative support for AT is more helpful for the school, I guess. Um, and then AT professional development isn't probably something that's gonna apply to you. But those first probably, excuse me, probably four or five, um, even six are really great. If like you ever have a disagreement with the school on are we doing a good job with this assessment, pull out one of these matrices and sit down and uh, together as a team and look at it. Um, so I just have a couple more slides here. Um, and I promise I wanna get to everybody's questions. Oops, let me just get back to where I was. Okay, so I had these too many examples of the set framework. Um, I'm gonna be like, maybe I'll just do one um, and I'm gonna try and be pretty brief about it. Um, but I just wanna show you like how the set can work um, with a student who has um, CVI. So this is a real example, um, although the, the students like, you know, I changed the gender and the name and the you know, other factors like the age and stuff, but it, this is loosely based on, you know, a real student, a real um, situation. Um, so uh, the student's name is Rachel, is charismatic preschool, charismatic preschool student who loves school and has a great relationship with her paraprofessional and teacher. Um, oops. Rachel has spastic quad, I don't know why that's happening, has spastic quadriplegia from cerebral palsy and has very little volitional movement. Um, the team feels Rachel has strong receptive language, but cannot produce speech. Um, she does vocalize to communicate with adults and people who know her well can interpret the vocalizations. Rachel has been scored on the CBI range and has a score of 2.5 to three. Her strongest field is her upper right and light and the color yellow are very stimulating for her vision. Rachel cannot see stimuli beyond two feet. Um, Rachel, and so that was the student in the environment. Rachel spends most of her day in the mainstream classroom with her peers. She is only um, inconsistently able to access her vision in the mainstream classroom, although there is a special workplace set up for her um, and appropriately adapted when Rachel needs to access her visual channel for learning. Rachel's classroom teacher and paraprofessionals are very skilled in the area of CVI and understand um, her visual needs clearly. Um, during morning meetings, students sit together in a circle on the floor. The teacher has made great efforts to um, decrease complexity in the circle time area, but Rachel struggles to use her vision during this activity. So that's the environment and then the task. And again, this is very simplified because in this example, we're just looking at one environment, one specific task in that environment. Um, every morning, the students are asked to pick a description of how they are feeling from the feeling wall. And the teacher places that feeling next to the child's name. Currently, the paraprofessional who knows Rachel well guesses how she is feeling based on her behavior and places the feeling um, next to Rachel's name. So mm, ooh, don't really feel great about that. I want Rachel to be a little more independent with that activity. So Rachel is able to vocalize. So the teacher, the visually impaired and speech and language pathologist, work together to set up a voice activated switch for Rachel. The switch is mounted to a black piece of felt. Um, on her wheelchair and position, so it is in her upper right field, one foot from her face. When Rachel vocalizes to indicate her selection, a yellow light flashes and the switch says, that's the one. Now the teacher um, reads off the day's feeling words slowly to Rachel and allows her processing time. When Rachel hears the feeling words she wants to choose. She uses her voice to activate the switch. Rachel's teacher then takes the feeling word and places it next to Rachel's name. All right, so that's an example of like a real task for a student with CVI and how you can use the set framework to consider the student, the environment, the task, and then at the end of all that, we consider the tool. And then Samuel is another example of a student, different kind of makeup, um, struggling with uh, the, to read with the complexity of, um, with his peers talking, 
Um, in the background, sometimes that looks like behavior. He just gets up and isn't doing his quiet reading time, but kids are talking and walking around at that same time. So Samuel's teacher, the visually impaired, works with the school team to purchase an iPad. She signs Samuel up for Bookshare and downloads the Voice Dream Reader app. She works with Samuel to set his preferred font and color settings and turns on word highlighting. Samuel uses the text to speech to uses the text to speech voice for audio assisted reading with noise canceling headphones. He reads visually, but having the audio support makes it so that he loses his place less often, less often and noise canceling headphones make it so he feels less frustrated when peers are talking. All right. So, gosh, I know I'm like totally being, I'm doing awful here, Rachel, but um, great. No worries. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to like say this really quickly, read through these really quickly. So people always want to know like what technology is good for a kid with CBI. I can't tell you because it depends on the kid, but some things to consider electronic magnification, um, near and distance, um, and handheld devices. So this is like what we call CCTVs. They can be great for isolating complex images or arrays on um, their backlit and they provide really nice positioning for some students. Obviously iPads, apps for reading, adapting materials, adapted workflows, the backlighting and positioning and auditory support is a real strength of those devices. Um, screen magnification and screen reading, um, isolate parts of the computer screen, um, you know, using screen magnification, reduce the complexity, um, allows you also to use auditory support then. Um, Dolphin guide, guide is worth considering for some students. So that's just a one little uh, piece of software I wanted to mention. You might want to write that down. For children who are really going to struggle with accessing a computer, Dolphin Guide can be um, a good option for some students. Um, it's going to take them a little bit outside of the general education workflow. It's going to take them a lot outside of the general education workflow, actually. But for some students, it's, a, it's an appropriate tool and not necessarily one that always comes to everybody's mind. Um, head mounted magnification. So those are things like um, the, the magnification glasses that you'll see people wear sometimes. Those can reduce complexity. Um, E-readers, so things like Kindles um, and Nooks. Um, AC devices, of course. Um, make sure the TVI is involved in that conversation. Um, positioning mounts, word processors, GPS, switches and switch interfaces. The clicker software, that's another thing I just want to mention. If you're not familiar with, write that down. Um, and then some low tech options, acetate sheets, line reading guides, alternative pencils, slant boards, bar magnifiers, slip on lights, and there's so much more. Um, and so that is the end of my presentation. Um, I just wanted to show really quickly two more things. So this is um, Joy Zabala's, oops, nope, that's something else I want to show you. Um, this is Joy Zabala's website. So this is where you can get the set framework documents. I think Rachel said she was going to link this um, for everybody. But these document, the set framework assessment documents are free and up there and available. There's a lot of really good additional articles about the set framework on her website. So um, definitely check that out. It was not designed specifically for visual impairments, but it's widely used in the field of assistive technology. The only other thing I just wanted to mention was um, this is something that I've been working on a lot. And before I say, um, before I say this, I'll just mention that I don't have any skin in this game. You know, I'm not like getting paid per stand or anything like that. I don't get any money for this. I just was very involved in the development of this particular um, piece of equipment. So um, this is an iPad slash tablet slash Chromebook slash phone stand. Um, so I was very frustrated with the fact that I didn't feel like there was a great iPad stand that existed out there that was low cost, um, that was good for um, positioning and like bringing things closer to kids' faces and tilting and stuff like that. It, it was, I, I designed this with an engineer with um, kids with all visual impairments in mind. So certainly kids with CVI were on, on my mind. Um, but it's relatively low cost. It's like about 50 or $60. Um, and it also is uh, made here locally from recycled materials in Vermont. So um, 
this, so this is what we want to avoid, right? This leaning over and, and getting really close um, to the device. Um, so it, it's not as flexible as like, you know, if you have a student who let's say is in a wheelchair and benefits from like a very adjustable, very flexible um, mount setup, that's a little bit different. Um, and those, you know, those setups are very expensive. Sometimes they're appropriate, but I just really wanted there to be something out there that was um, a little bit more ex inexpensive and, and also um, flexible and easy to carry around and put in backpacks and stuff like that. So that being said, I'm going to unshare my, so that if you're interested in that, I just want to mention that if you're interested in that, you can go to lvtabletstand.com. So that stands for low vision, but it's not, it's for many other people besides low vision people, lvtabletstand.com. Um, and that, I'm, I'm back, I'm here to answer questions. I'm sorry that I had too many slides, but I'm, 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 I'm gonna be fast at my questions. I'm gonna get a so chance. So wonderful. I could listen to you all day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just love how you dove into the set framework. Um, we're all gonna slap our hands, you know, tools at the very end. So I do it to myself. I do it to myself. Well, and it's just so hard as parents because like we see other parents, you know, we see all these ideas out there in the CVA community. It's like, oh, I'm gonna try that with my kid because we just want access. We just want to yes. see kids engage. And it's so hard to sometimes wait but it's really worth it. I, my personal experience is worth it to wait for the comprehensive assessment because, um, you know, I've seen Henry just soar. Anyways, we have a lot of questions coming in. Okay. We're going to go back to, you were talking a lot about IDEA and AT, which is mm -hmm. great. Um, if AT items are listed in the IEP, must um, they be both provided and used? And do the services, does the services page have to specify the frequency of use? So they certainly have to be provided for sure if you write that into the IEP. Now I'll just mention that best practice that is actually not to write the name of an individual device into IEP. It's mm. commonly done, but it's not best practice. Best practice is to put in the IEP the characteristics of a device. And you can get really specific with the characteristics so making it really pigeonholing it to one device. Mm -hmm. but but really the best practice is not necessarily to put a name brand in the IEP, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. However, yes, anything goes in the IEP. I mean, that's a legal document. The, the school has to provide that. Um, now the, the use question is a little bit complex because like, you know, I certainly have students who just refuse to use their assistive technology and, or they're just having a bad day or whatever. And that can get a little tricky because I'm, I'm never a supporter of the idea of forcing kids to use mm -hmm. technology that they don't want to use. I think it it just puts a sour taste in the kid's mouth and it gets you get into this power struggle cycle that is really hard to break out of. Um, but certainly go back to those quality indicators and in, um, for AT because there's one in AT implementation and that one will be really helpful to you on this particular topic because that particular matrix talks a lot about like what does a quality implementation of assistive technology look like in a kid's day. So like everybody's trained on it, like it's being used like uh, consistently across the child's day, like they're given a lot of opportunities to have access to it, like all of those things you'll find in that AT implementation. So that if you're kind of feeling like, oh, are we using the device enough throughout the day or, or people know how to use it, sitting down and doing that matrix as that made that particular matrix as a team could be really helpful in helping you kind of pinpoint like, well, why isn't this getting used in all environments and across the day? Is this, I mean, you might actually find maybe this device isn't appropriate in all environments, or maybe the kid is like having a meltdown by the end of the day and they can't use this visual device by the end of the day or this, this particular professional isn't trained on the device. So it can kind of like help you pick out some of those holes that might be there and sort of help you think through them as a team. Yeah, that's great. I love those quality indicators. I can't wait to dive into those. Um, does IDEA specify the qualification of professionals providing AT services? That's a great question. Um, I don't think that it does off the top of my head, other than it just talks about a qualified, you know, qualified professionals, um, people who, it talks a lot about people who are familiar with the child. Um, you can certainly, like I have certainly gone in and helped with assistive technology evaluations for kids I don't have relationships with. However, I'm leaning really heavily on the team 
um, to, to, I'm just there to facilitate the conversation essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's the team that's there to do the assessment. Um, so, so no, I don't think it says like they must have a master's degree in this, you know, to, to be qualified to do an AT assessment, but the person has to be highly knowledgeable about the child or at least have highly knowledgeable people around them. And also, um, and also just multiple perspectives and voices considered. Yeah, great. Um, discuss recommendations for evaluations for students and communities that do not have access to AT professionals. Um, so I think in this, that's a great question because that's, there's, you know, right, there's very few of us out there and the, the, those of us exist, unfortunately, uh, there's an even smaller percentage of those people who know anything about CVI. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what I will say is that oftentimes districts, um, especially bigger districts, have at least one person who's kind of like the assistive technology person in the district. There you should be like an ed tech person who is an assistive technology person. If that person is skilled and it, they may not know anything about visual impairments, but if they understand assistive technology, they should be able to lead the team through an assessment process, even if they're not familiar with those individual products. I think the fact that remote like has just exploded and people are having a lot more access to professionals um, is a good thing in a lot of ways. So it's possible, you know, like, I, you know, even reaching out to a place like Perkins, for example, you know, they may be willing Certainly, I've, I've had Perkins teachers come, you know, around to different districts um, to do AT assessments in person. Um, but now with, you know, all this remote stuff that's going on, it, it's very possible that places like Perkins may be able to support the team through a remote assessment. Um, also going to your local um, vendor. So like here in New England, we have New England Low Vision. Um, you know, there's a lot of stats that somebody the school district could contract with, and they um, have a lot of knowledge in the AT assessment process. They may not have the cortical visual impairment background, but again, that's why you need, you know, you're not going to find, it's very unlikely you're going to find that magic person who's got the CDI knowledge, the AT knowledge, the, you know, PT knowledge, the OT knowledge, and also is parenting the child. And, you know, there's no way that there's one person who's got all that. And so it's about like pulling people together who have, like figuring out what skills do we need to bring in to bear in this, to like get a strong assessment and then finding those people and pulling them together. Um, you mentioned the level of independence of a student. Mm -hmm. A parent asks, what is reasonable? What does a reasonable level of independence mean? That's a great question. And this is, it's such a hard question to answer. The only thing I can tell you is that I get, um, I, I get this particular kind of feeling in my stomach <laughs> that tells me whether or not I'm feeling good about what I'm seeing. Because mm -hmm. there's certainly... There's certainly kids with conglomerations of challenges that are just going to require more adult support during the day. And that is okay. And that is valid. And that child is um, a equal and worthy learner in their space and all those things. But like the Rachel example, I think is a great one, right? So was it easy for the paraprofessionals to pick the feeling off the feeling wall? Yeah. And like, were we just kind of getting through the day that way? Sure. But it, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, I got that feeling in my stomach, like, you know, I think Rachel could pick out her own feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even if she's not accurate 100% of the time, how the heck is she going to learn to pick out her feeling unless she's given the opportunity? So, um, you know, my, I'm, everybody's got their own kind of opinions about this, but I'm, my personal practice is always like, slow down. I would rather the child get half of the work done independently than get all of it done with 75% support. Yeah. Um, because the danger of that is that it just is hard for kids to catch up, you know? And so um, so it's, it's kind of getting to that place where we, like as a team, you can sit there and you can all look at each other and look at yourselves in the mirror and say, we have backed off supports to the absolute greatest extent possible. And this is the scaffolding that the child just absolutely requires to get through their day. Um, 
and not because we want them to be at our pace, not because we want them to transition as fast as everybody else, not because we, you know, want this X amount of work done in one day, um, but because like we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say like, this is the level of the adult support that the child requires to do things independently. So I, that's kind of a vague answer and, and I apologize for that, but that's, um, I've just, you know, I've just developed, I guess, what I call like the ick factor in my tummy. <laughs> that's, that's what I would recommend for you is like, do you feel a little queasy and think, oh, this just doesn't, I think that there's a way this kid could do this. And, and then there usually is if you've got that feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I love that perspective. Um, question about, I think when we're talking about in the set framework, we'd look at an individual task. Well, then how are we planning for AT throughout the day and across mm -hmm. environments throughout the day? Yeah. So, so I just want to be clear, like my set framework example was really, really little. Mm -hmm. um, we are, when we do the set framework, we are looking at all tasks, all environments across the day. That was just like a little tiny snapshot. So you get a sense of what it might look like um, for just a tiny little piece of it. Mm -hmm. But we make sure that we look at every environment and every task, every workflow that that child has to um, be involved in across their day. So I could, so you would have a, a really long running record then of the mm -hmm. whole day. So it'd be multiple tasks. It could be anywhere from, you know, eight to 10 tasks and you go through the whole, yeah. Yep. Great. And, and you look at like what tasks are similar, right? Cause there's a lot of tasks mm -hmm. across the day that are really functionally similar. So you can kind of clump those together. Mm -hmm. But I and get so specific as like, you know, that's why I really want the PT there. like. Yeah. opening the bathroom door like I I'm like you got to do a task analysis like okay the kid goes to the bathroom what does that mean what does going to the bathroom look like for that kid mm -hmm. you know like if if they could do everything in, independently with the bathroom except for they can't get the door open like oh no like that's a place where my tummy starts getting that feeling so I'm right. like can we get a hook can we get a something to and that's assistive technology you know so yeah. Yeah, so it's, is that about that task analysis breakdown? It's not just they go to the bathroom. It's they open the door, they push the door open, they flip on the light, you know, and and like really look like how many of those things is an adult doing, and do they need to be doing all those things, you know? I love that. I love really breaking down the task analysis. That's really helpful because it's something some, just. I mean, as a parent, it just becomes automatic what you do. For oh yeah, um, of course. That's a really great way to look at it, though. And so then. As a result, do you feel like you can find tools that maybe support multiple tasks throughout the day? Yes. But then there also might be some very specific tools like the door hook, for example. Yeah. Okay, okay that's kind of where it comes into. Yeah. Um, let's see, more questions coming in. So in my district, the teacher trialed AT, but was not always trained on the device or CVI. For example, not trained in AAC, should the person yeah. trialing, evaluating be trained first? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. The person who's trialing a device with a child needs to know how to use the device. And, and really, you know, ideally it's not the TVI who's trialing a AAC device, it's the speech language pathologist. Because that really, of course, the TVI could be trained by the speech language pathologist to implement it during the time that the TVI is working with a child, that's totally normal. And I do that all the time. However, like I, I always, I mean, even me who I'm pretty comfortable with AAC, I, that I still want an SLP to, to be the person who's, who's you sort of in charge because, you know, really it's, it's an, it's an AT device, but it's at its core, it's a communication device. And so we need the communication expert, I think, to be in charge of that. Yeah. Um, so certainly can a TVI help implement an AC device across the day? Absolutely. But yes, you're right. They need to get received training in it first. <laughs> yeah. We had a really bad situation where Henry's passed way, way past TV. I just didn't really know how to incorporate the iPad successfully. And it's just, so it was just mm -hmm. never used. And it was, I'm sure a lot of CA parents can relate, but mm -hmm. yeah, so they need to be trained first. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And that goes back to that AT services, right? So that is something that IDEA provides for. Mm -hmm. That's like, if you're, you know, and sometimes like I, we're all humans. I mean, I'm a TVI. You can get in your shame space about like, I should know, I should know how to use this and I don't, and it's embarrassing. And so, you know, like we need to wipe that out, like wipe that off the table, zero embarrassment, zero anything. You know, that is why IDA includes the training of professionals under an AT service, because 
how could you possibly be an expert in everything you can? And so you've got to be able to just say, you know what, I don't know what the heck I'm doing here. And, and then, you know, come together as a team to figure out, well, what kind of training do we need to make this happen? That's so good to know. <laughs> so many things I wish I knew. Okay. Um, any tips on maximizing the use of assistive technology during remote learning? Well, I, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, so the first thing I will say, because I have a lot of teacher friends and I'm in a lot of districts, all kids are struggling right now, all of them. So, I mean, I was just was talking to a case manager who told me that 75% of the kids in his district have zero participation on remote days. So it's not just like, I, that's the thing I keep telling parents too. It's like, it's not just your kid. Like, actually I'm finding that my kids with you know, visual impairments and, and special needs, mostly the parents are, they're like, those kids are getting more work done than the Ed kids are doing because the parents are like, all right, we're here doing this work today. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing I would say is you're, are, you're already doing amazing. Keep going, you're killing it. You're, you're just the best in the whole world. Um, that's number one. And just get right, get a little screenshot of me saying that watch yourself every morning or watch it for yourself every morning. Um, but the second question, the sort of the second thing I would say is I actually have a, um, blog post. I wrote about this on, um, passive technology. So I don't know if we can link that, yeah. that, that particular post though, is about, um, is about how to set up like remote video. Like, how do you think about like looking at, like the child perceiving the video and um, presenting the video like from the perspective of the provider and the family? Like, what can you do to reduce complexity? And as the provider, like, what should you be wearing? Where should you be standing? So, um, I ho hopefully that's helpful um, to some extent. But I mean, the rally situation is there isn't a there is not somebody. I don't think. I mean, I haven't met them. Maybe there is who's with CVI, who's not going to struggle, you know, even my phase three kids who are like work, you know, I've graduated from high school or working and, you know, doing great living independently, all that stuff would not struggle with seven and a half hours a day on a computer. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of, a lot of kids, even with ocular visual impairments are also, we're having to like rethink, like giving mm -hmm. them more auditory access, you know, giving them more breaks, all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, okay. Can you recommend any AT for reading large print for a student who needs switch access to read independently? Mm -hmm. So um, the first two things that come to my mind are Tar Heel Reader. If you're not familiar with that, definitely look up Tar Heel Reader and also Pictello. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that come to mind immediately. The problem with those though, is that if you start, so I guess that, that, well, there's ways to adapt. Certainly you can adapt um, materials for um, kids who are reading higher level texts um, to, to Tar Heel Reader and Pictello. Traditionally, Tar Heel Reader and Pictello is more geared towards sort of like emerging readers and people who are kind of still learning to read rather than like reading to learn. Um, that's kind of the traditional way that it's been used, but there's, there's no reason that you couldn't adapt a you know, 12th grade text to um, Pictello, but there's probably some easier ways of doing that when you get to like the higher levels of reading, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm the one who took up all the time, so I'll <laughs> stay. <laughs> I want to ask some of the um, previously submitted questions. Yeah spoke a lot about, you know, the keeping the end user in mind. And mm -hmm. so, you know, a parent, she kind of made a statement slash question about, you know, in terms of how to make sure that the student is highly involved in selecting yeah. an AT that works for them. I mean, a student, even students, you know, who have complex, you know, range of complex needs, like how do we make sure that they are still involved and have that autonomy of choice and what works best for them? Yes, that is so important. And, um, you know, I, I, and as I said, I have not met, like, so I have a fundamental belief that all people can learn and all people have rich interior lives. And if you believe those two things, then there, then it's impossible that somebody with an end, you know, somebody, any end user doesn't have something to contribute to their AT assessment, right? Um, and so I think a lot of it is about slowing the way the heck down 
like even when our own anxiety is getting at us as adults like that kind of like we've got to find the thing that works and and i'll kind of give an example here um it's a little it is at i mean there's an at involved in it but um i think i shared this example with you the other day rachel um so i i had I have a student um, who's deafblind and has CVI and is kind of like a very early phase two kid. Um, he's got no functional hearing at all. And um, he, you know, we, he came into school that they, the family had really worked hard on sign language and, and they're amazing. Um, but he just had never really approximated anything, you know, and there, so there's so much anxiety around like, with like communication, early communication, we've got to make this happen. We've got to make this happen. And we really had to learn like to just slow way down to think really carefully about this, these, this child's sensory channels um, to like try things and let him touch things and let him put them in his mouth and let him explore and let him play. Mm -hmm. And over time, like these patterns started to emerge and you know, now he's at, he's at the point where he's like approximating on body signs and he's um, using 3D printed. So the project core symbols, if you're not familiar with those, you can look those up, the 3D printed project core symbols. Um, but, you know, if we had just kind of rushed in and been like, okay, we're, we're anxious about the fact that we need to get a more formalized communication system going. So we're just going to do this. You know, I don't think he, it would have been successful. We, he had to tell us what was going to work for him and um, and and the only way to get there was to be very, very slow, very methodical, very like student centered. Um, so, so a lot, you know, even sometimes what I'll do is like, I'll, I'll just bring a device into the child's space. You know, I won't, I will make no demands of them, but I'll just bring the device into the child's space and like have it as something that's there and see what kind of reaction I get, you know, like, did I get a little smile? Did I even something as subtle as, did I get a little increase in, in breathing? I mean, that is information that the child is giving you, you know? Um, was there a little quieting to a sound? So, the, so just taking into consideration all those things. That's awesome. You're so intuitive, I love it. You're so perceptive. Um, let's see, what, um, oh, we already asked that question. Um, very specific question. Does it e-guard on the iPad, which helps with motor control, create vision challenges? Yeah, this is, I was like, I was, I read this question. I was like, oh shoot, I've got to give my most annoying answer, which is it depends. <laughs> so for some kids it doesn't and for others it does. And so I think that's a part of why that AT assessment mm -hmm. is so critical, right? Because you, yeah. you trial it both ways. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's super helpful. I have some students that's extremely helpful for because they are not accessing, like for the example on their AC device, they because they're not accessing it visually at all. They're only accessing it through motor planning. And so that having that, you know, little orientate, like tactile orientation is really helpful for them. Other kids who are primarily accessing it visually, it might be too complex. So again, it's that like understanding the learn the sensory channels and like really piecing that out and trying it both ways. And seeing what happens. <laughs> Love it. Um, Okay, so a question about, um, you know, for folks who are, you, I mean, I think this is in general, not only to AAC devices, but, you know, trying to come up with real life pictures for words like please or more. Yeah. Um, so you've been mixing sign language with using the device. Is it a bad idea to use encourage multiple ways of communication? So the answer to, is it bad to, um, encourage multiple ways of communication. I'm not a speech language pathologist. I'm just giving you my personal opinion. Please know that I'm not a speech language pathologist. I think a lot of speech, like, speech language pathologists would agree with me yeah. um, is absolutely like please, multimodal communication is the way to go. And actually, if you're only encouraging one kind of communication for a kid with complex communication needs, you might want to think about a second, you know, or a third or a fourth. Mm -hmm. Um, communication modality, like that student I was just talking about, you know, pretty complex kid. He's got on body signs, he's got touch cues, he's got, um, he's got tactile symbols, uh, you know, sometimes there's visual sign and, and yeah, the more communication, the merrier. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so no, but I understand the question you're asking about the real images of like what we more call like the core vocabulary, um, the more abstract language. And 
So you might want to look at Project Core because they have developed a more simplified set of um, of icons essentially for um, those kind of the, what we call the core vocabulary. So they, the Project Core has the tactile symbols, but they also have like pretty pared down simple core vocabulary symbols as well. However, they're still line drawings. You know, they're still like yeah abstract representations. Right. So um, so. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard, I've, I've heard Christine Roman talk before about that she's had success with actually using words um, instead of pictures. Yeah, um, I think a lot of parents so, have success with that too. Yeah, um, yeah. So I haven't seen it, but that would definitely be something for again that the IT assessment would be a great, yeah. you know, maybe maybe instead of focusing on this like abstract icon, we focus on the word, mm -hmm. and we try and you know teach the word to the to the child. So that would be my suggestion. Nice. All right, two more questions. Um, oh, I just lost the question. Let's, there's a few questions about presentation of the device. You know, mm -hmm. are the location, the angle of device critical? I mean, if, I know it depends on what the division's needs, yeah. but this parent was saying, my son moves around a lot and is challenging to know how well he's seeing the device. Not sure if I move it along with him or just leave it in one place. Yeah, that's a correct. So yeah, I would say angle presentation and like how it's presented is, important to almost every person with CDI I've ever met in my life. Right. Um, so yes, however, what I will say is I don't think that, I don't know, it depends on the kid. It's so, it's so specific, but what I will say is what I tend towards is leaving the device in a consistent place that I know for sure that the child knows how to how to access and how to orient themselves to mm -hmm. rather than chasing them around with it. Because actually when you chase them around with it, um, like I'm not totally sure that they, it depends on the kid again, but mm -hmm. like, can they actually find it, you know? So is it better to have it in a place that you're sure they orient themselves to that they can always return to if they need to? Like if they really consistently can go to the couch and they know it's the couch and they get up on the couch and because that's where they like to sit. Like, is the couch a good place for it? Because it's a consistent place to return to. Um, however, that being said, sometimes I will carry it around and like just have it, you know, in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll even sometimes, like, again, I think it's about not always being so like, behold it to the tyrant of vision, you know, because there's a lot of other great senses yeah. um, and maybe they don't see it, you know, but can I like put it against their leg, right? So like that they just know it's there. Mm -hmm. um, can I, can I make it make some sound, okay. you know, so that they know it's there, so. Yeah, I love that. Um, last question. Um, you spoke about AT projecting into adulthood, which is really wonderful. Um, to tell, to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm very pro age appropriateness for all children, regardless of what, whether they have disabilities or not. Um, and I think you could possibly, uh, you know, not provide kids robust opportunities, depending on if you choose devices that um, don't have the flexibility to grow with them. Um, so so, you know, I think that a lot of our kids already have a lot of social barriers as it is. And so why would we want to add any social barriers by not, you know, allowing them to be age appropriate, like all their peers are age appropriate. Like, so, you know, that's why something like an iPad is a really, you know, that's why I think it becomes such a popular device is because it's a great example of that. It's a device that you can really, really pare down and have very simple access to. And it's a device that you wouldn't even blink an eye if you saw an adult, you know, on a train using an iPad. So, um, but that, but the iPad isn't the only example of that kind of device. Right. And that they can be able to use it independently once they leave school. That is very important. Right. And so that, you know, finding things that a child can use independently. And also I always like to mention, like, don't forget about computer use. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, not, you, you can set up a computer with switches and, you know, so there's, you can access a computer with very complex stuff going on. Um, but I think that sometimes we forget about computer use with our kids with CDI. We're like, oh, the iPad works so well. So let's just go with the, 
the iPad, which is, I mean, the iPad's a great tool, right? I mean, but but kids with CVI need a toolkit like any child with a visual impairment needs a toolkit. Right. And, you know, like if I want to think about my students working someday and being living independently and all those things, you know, it's it's hard to like go get a job or to live in an apartment or whatever if you don't know how to use a computer. And so, um, so that is the other piece I would just say is that don't kind of in that project them into adulthood piece, mm -hmm. don't necessarily think, forget about those independent living pieces as well. Oh my goodness, I could talk to you all day. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been such a fabulous and really important conversation. Um, there's so much more to talk about. And as you said, we need so much more research on assistive technology yes. in our kids with CVI. So anybody watching, Let's get that going. Um, really wonderful questions and insights. Thank you so much to our CVI Now parent community. Um, and hopefully you felt like you just were able to sit down and have a conversation with Allie. Um, that's really the purpose of these events. Um, and I just want to send a heartfelt thank you to you, Allie. Thank you for being so gracious with your time and your expertise. You're really brilliant. So thank you. And um, be sure to check out cvinow.org to learn more and all about CVI. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Be well, stay safe, and a happy new year. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this event brought to you by CVI Now here at Perkins School for the Blind. Go to cvinow.org to learn more.